We are live. Admitting. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Pat. I'm from the Dallas Public Library. Um, we'll be giving a few minutes for everybody to jump into the call. Thanks for joining us today for our program um, with Candice, giving us some information on some teas. So um, thank you again for joining us. And just a fair warning, we are recording this program. So if you prefer not to be on screen, we just ask that you disable your camera and we'll keep you muted throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, you can enter them in the chat and either Helen or I will um, read the questions out to Candice throughout the presentation. Thanks for joining us. Once again, if you were just jumping into our uh, presentation, thanks for joining us today. I'm Pat from the Dallas Public Library. We have Candace joining us today from Chandra Teas, who will be discussing various types of teas today for us. Um, um, just a forewarning, we are recording. So if you prefer not to be on camera, we just ask for you to disable your camera on your computer and um, remain muted. If you have any questions, you can fill them, put them in the chat and either Helen or I will read them out. Thank you. We'll be starting here shortly. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started so we can get to the good stuff. I'm going to do a brief introduction and share my screen momentarily. And then we're gonna to get to the, the reason why we're all here to learn more about teas. So uh, my name is Helen Dulac. I am with the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability and uh, DEQS along with the Dallas Public Library are so excited to be partnering today on this series called Grow With Us. It is every Monday at noon. Uh, I want to give you just a brief history of our department because you've probably never heard of us. Uh, we were formed back in 2004 and we were known as the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve a special environmental certification called ISO 14001. And what that means is we looked at our operations across 14 different departments in the city and to see how we could do those with less of an environmental impact. And we actually got, oops, we actually got a special certification and we get audited every year to make sure that the equipment we use all the way to the paper and the copy machines uh, have as little impact to the environment as possible. Uh, now in 2018, a lot of changes happened in my department. There was a reorganization in the city and our department actually doubled in size. And to reflect that we changed our name to Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Uh, also that year, with that reorganization, we created a combined outreach and engagement team that I am a proud member of. The following year in 2019, we, uh, we, we, were, we got our own council committee. So Mayor Johnson created the first committee on the environment and sustainability. I believe they meet monthly on Mondays, the first Monday of the month, and you are welcome to watch those presentations. And it's a great thing to do to keep an eye on the environmental pulse of the city. Now, if you have heard of our department, it's probably because on May 27th, the city of Dallas adopted its first climate action plan, and it is known as CCAP. 
and you can see it in its entirety, all 250 pages at dallasclimateaction.com. And as the city moves forward for the next 30 years, you'll see a lot of our actions tied to that CCAP plan, including this Grow With Us series that goes to help uh, everyone have access to healthy foods. Uh, now, I mentioned that our department doubled in size and you can see what is in green. Those are the three new groups that joined us in 2018. I'm gonna talk about one of those just briefly and that is stormwater. So we've had a lot of experience with that last night and today. Uh, stormwater is rain or even your sprinkler runoff that leaves your property, goes into the street, travels down those gutters and goes into that big drain at the end of the street. That big drain is called a storm drain inlet and it's there for one reason and it's to remove the rain so the streets don't flood. And we have about 60, 70,000 of these in the city of Dallas. They work so great and re at removing that water quickly that that water is not cleaned and it is not treated before it connects into a creek or a stream. So we're asking you to be really mindful about what you do outside because pollution on your property might not stay there. Uh, if there's bacteria from pet waste that you forgot to pick up, uh, if your car was leaking oil in the driveway, if there's a little bit of litter, you know, Halloween's coming up, there might be a lot of candy wrappers left outside. Those things are going to get collected by that rainwater or that sprinkle water carried into those storm drain inlets. And that's how pollution and trash end up in the Trinity River and in our lakes. So I mentioned this outreach and engagement team that I'm on. Well, we want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And that's a big thing to do. So how do we do that? We do that by virtual presentations like this and also in person when we're allowed. You can invite us to talk for free at your HOA, any sort of club or organization. We also have a lot of material for students anywhere from K to college. And we also host events. Upcoming, we have the 26th Waterwise Landscape Tour. Uh, to get more details on that, visit savedallaswater.com. And there are two parts to that. You can enter your WaterWise landscape to be an inspiration stop on the tour. You need to do that by October 31st at midnight. And then you can also come back on November 7th and attend the seminar, which is free and open to everybody. And it's going to be a great way to learn more about WaterWise plants. Realize they're not just cacti and rocks. It is a lot more than that. And also uh, listen to some fantastic speakers we have lined up. One of which is Susanna Cruz, who's going to talk about backyard foraging, about all the different things that you can eat that you can grow in your backyard, not just vegetables, some things that you might not realize. Uh, and if you do invite us to speak at your club, organization, or HOA meeting, we can talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. If you want to get in contact with us or learn more, you can visit our website, greendallas.net. And there is an event request form on our homepage. You just fill that out and we will be happy to set up a virtual presentation. And if you ever have any questions for me or any of my coworkers, just send an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com and we will get back to you. And please, please follow us on social media so you can learn about great presentations like we have today and other ones we have in the future. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. And so with that, it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce Candace Chandra. She is the founder and chief curator and purveyor of specialty teas and spice concoctions. Chandra's tea and spice started in October, 2019, but Candace has been curating functional tea concoctions for 30 years. Her interest was piqued when she traveled through the Amazon and met with native healers. Candace has a master's in applied health from Tulane University's School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and has worked for the World Health Organization, the Swiss Red Cross, and other multinational organizations on environmental health issues in over 27 countries. Recently, she has been the CEO of a federally qualified center and an entrepreneur. So with that, I am so excited to get started today. Are you ready, Candace? I'm ready. Thank you, Helen. That was a great introduction. I'm definitely going to sign up for all those things for Green Dallas. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that Chandra Tea and Spice really, really does its best to be what I call a regenerative business. So working off of your presentation, we do everything to reduce zero waste at every point of our supply chain. We try to make everything reusable and uh, as organic, meaning from, from the earth so that it degrades as possible. Um, in our packaging, our teas are 
all sorts from small holders who used regenerative agricultural practices. And um, yeah, just wholeheartedly believe in what you're doing. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone today. Uh, I tried to get the lighting, but I know it's a little strange because uh, it's really dark in my house today. So hopefully you can see me. I'm gonna be live all day, or, or not all day. I'm gonna be live during this show. And so if you have any questions, just feel free to um, put it in the chat box and I'll answer them as they come in. And uh, I'm gonna be showing you a couple of different items. So uh, Tropic Tea and Spice focuses on what they call functional tea and functional mixtures of tea and spice. And what that means is that it has a health and wellness benefit as well as hopefully tasting really good. So um, some of what we're doing today is looking at um, the different ways to brew some of these teas. Uh, the whole idea around functional tea and spice is uh, to use local and seasonal ingredients as much as possible. Um, I follow the mantra of let nature nurture you. So as we are moving into the colder weather, many of the plants are producing items that we need to help combat whatever we might be dealing with during this time of year. Um, so you'll see throughout the year that uh, my company promotes different combinations throughout the year, even though they're available if you want them at any time. Um, so I put together a special combination for today and I asked some friends to name it. They came up with Big D T. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna show you my Big D T combination. This is it pre-made. I don't know if you can see all the different seeds. Um, it is a combination of black tea from Turkey, actually. It's got a nice, strong, robust flavor. Um, the part of Turkey that abuts the mountains getting closer to China and Iran. And then I've um, added fennel seeds, mustard seeds, and spearmint. And I think you'll find this taste is, uh, it's kind of heartening, you know, because of the colder weather, you want something with a little bit more of a bite to it, right? And, and a little more complexity. So previously in the summer, I was mixing a lot of uh, herbs and spices into green tea and white tea. But as we move into the winter season, Personally, I really like to use different black teas. Um, and there are a lot of different black teas. Some of the most common places that you can find black tea is China, of course, India, but also places like Eritrea, um, now Nigeria and Kenya, and even some from South America. And most recently, the United States is getting into the tea farming um, arena. And so on my way to see my parents this Christmas, uh, they're up in Virginia, I will be passing by the Lipton Tea Plantation in South Carolina. And then there are some other startup tea farms in um, Louisiana and Mississippi that I hope to stop by and see as well. And I encourage you to look at their um, at their products, because one of the really interesting things about tea is we delve into it more, and I'm just talking about the tea plant itself, so black tea, oolong, green, white, or yellow tea, um, all come from the same plant, they come from Camellia sinensis, but just like wine, just like that famous vine, the grape, um, tea takes on a distinct flavor, um, aroma, color, and even health benefits because yes, tea also just by itself has health benefits um, depending on the soil and the water and the sunshine in which it was grown. 
So even within China, there are very distinct flavors and, um, and even methods of treating the tea when you take it off the plant. Um, it's very, uh, it's a very intensive agricultural practice that's still for the most part done by hand throughout the production cycle. So you're supporting a lot of people when you drink tea. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant in and of itself. Um, it looks like historically, uh, they, uh, the Chinese started drinking it about 3,000 years ago. And um, they, they say that one of the emperors who was a great scientist as well, who was interested in um, the flora and fauna of his country, excuse me, um, was sitting under a tree and instead of an apple, like for us, with Isaac Newton, um, in his case, he had just boiled some water and he had a cup, probably an open cup, much like this. This is a Japanese tea cup called a Gaiwan, but this is um, this is probably what the emperor in China was uh, using to hold his hot water. And apparently a leaf of tea from the tea plant, Camellia sinensis, fell into it, and when he tasted it, he thought, how refreshing. <laughs> and that is the beginning of the tea industry. And it is now the second most consumed beverage in the world uh, after water. Um, but as we all know, water is the main basis of tea. So uh, for real tea aficionados and you can go and certify and become a tea sommelier, just like a wine sommelier. Uh, so they actually start that whole process with how to um, take care of the water that goes into making your tea. You don't get to all the different kinds of tea and tea leaves and how to uh, process them and how to brew them until quite a bit ways down their certificate process. So water is considered the mother of tea um, and the vessel is considered the father, which is an interesting analogy for those of us in the West. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is show you um, how to brew some tea because the brewing also, once you arrange to get your clean hopefully pure spring water, but if not, then um, at least the cleanest, freshest running water that you can find. Um, you put it into your teapot. I prefer still an old fashioned teapot on the stove. I like to listen to it. Um, again, tea aficionados call that the screaming of the water, <laughs> but it tells you a lot about uh, the temperature. So, for me, tea is so much about developing community, but also the ritual and ceremony about producing a really tasty cup of tea. So uh, I enjoy all the different aspects of it. And for me, there is flavor, of course. There's the smell of the, of the combinations that we put together here at Chandra Tea, but also there's the, um, sound, the sound of the water. There's the color. Again, um, in the springtime, we I have curated some teas with flowers in them. And so it changes the color. You're probably all aware of uh, some of the hand-picked teas that are then folded like origami to go into a teacup and unfurl as the water um, heats them up and so you get a clear cup or a clear uh, teapot and um, it's just a beautiful process and then most of us who enjoy tea also enjoy nature so uh, for me this is a way of connecting to nature um, since I'm interested in the health aspects of tea and spice um, I find that no matter where I am, it not only has a health effect on my immediate body, so for example, the spearmint 
kind of releases that menthol and opens my nose on kind of a cold, wet, drippy day like today. But also it reminds me, right? So smell evokes memories and um, it either calms me down if it's a spearmint because I have really good memories of where I was as a child when I drank a lot of spearmint or when I drink black tea, it reminds me of the time that I lived in Europe and spent a lot of time with friends drinking tea in various locations in different countries. So I think those memories and um, cultural differences around tea are so fascinating. And um, I'm lucky to be adding those herbs and spices into the, the well today to the black tea because it creates for me a really rich, um, I'll call it a palette, a really rich palette of memories and, um, and evokes all the different senses. And I hope it does that for you. And the other thing I, I would like to touch on a little bit is uh, the ceremony. As you know, there are lots of different ceremonies. I think we're particularly familiar with the Japanese matcha tea ceremony that's so beautiful and restrained. But just about every country that I traveled to when I worked for WHO um, during that time offered me tea as part of an opening to getting to know one another, even in a business setting. And it wasn't always um, camellia sinensis. Sometimes, for example, in Morocco, it was a mint tea. And the whole ceremony and the different um, utensils and the different pots and the different types of cups that were used are such a pleasure too. I mean, for tea, you can just dig into so many aspects. So I encourage you that even if you find that drinking tea for you is, is uh, rather mundane, I encourage you to look into the other aspects of tea because it can be a really fascinating rabbit hole to down, fall down into, especially during these COVID nights when we can't get together with other people. Um, I find quite often on a Friday night that uh, I kind of disappear into Wikipedia <laughs> as I research all these different things and look at the pictures. Um, Helen very nicely brought a beautiful teapot today. Would you right. show us that teapot? Absolutely. So thank you for uh, remembering. So this is, uh, I have several teapots. And this is one that I particularly love. This has got Japanese cherry blossoms on it. And as you can see, it matches my screen. So I obviously enjoy the cherry blossom tree. <laughs> I incorporate it into my decor. And this one actually also has cups that are white with red versus a teapot that is red with white. And um, so, you know, I had a couple questions about this, Candace. Why is the teapot shaped like this? Like in the West, we're used to taller type pots. This mm -hmm. one is very flat. Well, so different cultures um, brew their tea differently. And that's one thing we're going to talk about. Thank you. Um, some some uh, bring to the table the pot filled with hot water and have added the leaves at the last minute. And they pour a little bit into the cup and keep pouring it back and forth because they like a very fresh cup. Um, I would say that the particular pot that you have is good for that. Um, and in the West, again, we drink quite large cups of tea. But as you know, if you go to like a, a Chinese restaurant or a Japanese restaurant, this is enormous compared to what you normally get. It's very small. So they're really relishing the flavor and also who they're sharing the tea with. So the the whole ceremony of preparing that tea at the table is important, but for that reason, they keep it pretty small. Um, one of the things I've learned um, after starting this company is the temperature of the water as you drink your tea makes such a big difference in the flavor profile. And so um, I think almost any Asian culture is very aware of that. And so to 
keep it within the flavor profile that they like. If you'll pick it up again, Helen, you'll see that it's, it's not too large and it's flat so that you can't put too many leaves in at one time. And then uh, it's got a very nice pouring aspect. That's um, so where the handle is and where the spout is makes uh, collectors go crazy for that sort of thing. They are constantly comparing where the handle and the spout are, how deep the pot is. Um, that is not an area that I'm super knowledgeable about, yeah. but I plan to be, so give me a couple of years and I'll do it again. But um, that is my understanding of that particular pot is they are more interested in a, a rapid pouring and a um, interactive, like I said, they, they pour a little tea into the cup and then they pour it back into the pot three times that's considered um, common courtesy to both develop the flavor of the tea, but also to show the community that you're sharing that particular teapot with that you care that they're getting the best part for them. So, that's fascinating. Yeah, and then in our case with our tall uh, teapots, so um, tea didn't make its way to Europe until, well, I mean, you could argue that the Dutch brought it in the 1600s, but it didn't become really popular until um, the very late 1700s and early 1800s. So, you know, our famous Boston Tea Party, we were actually very, very um, with the times over here in the colonies because we already had tea before 1776 and the British were just discovering it. Um, and the British are the ones that normally have the tall teapots. Uh, they were just really getting into making a ceremony around tea at that time. And um, they had been exposed to the China in, um, well, the China in China. <laughs> and uh, they finally realized that they could make their, their own type, you know, so they could design not only what, this is a Chinese um, cup that I'll discuss in a minute because as you can see, it has several different components, but they could design different, um, different pictures on the china itself, but they could also design the actual functionality of the cup or the pot. And so they started getting into it. It was apparently a countess in England in I think 1824 who got hungry at four o'clock in the afternoon, like we do. I mean, I get peckish, especially after walking my dog. <laughs> And, you know, again, during COVID, nobody's watching. So I sit down and I have a nice little tea. And that's exactly what she did. And she decided that it might be fun to do with some friends. And pretty soon it became the rage. And we still go to high tea today with scones and cream. Um, but because uh, the British like a very deep, dark tea, they primarily drank black tea or oolong. Um, they liked a pot where it would sit for a long time. Um, again, with Helen's pot, the, the Japanese and the Chinese actually use different types of clay and different firing methods uh, for different pots to be used with different types of tea leaf. So if you use that pot, Helen, with black or oolong, you should stay with that particular type of tea and not, for example, use green tea or a white or a yellow tea with it because um, according to the Japanese and the Chinese, the clay inside the teapot, even though I think yours has a glaze on it. It does, yes. Yeah, but even so they say that when you, so in the West, or maybe around the world right now because of COVID, we're all crazy about cleaning everything to the nth degree. But when you drink tea out of a pot, that pot, um, if you're a tea aficionado, becomes dedicated to that type of tea um, because they say that the flavor of the tea interacts, particularly the tannins, with the inside of the teapot. 
And so that gunky looking brown stuff on the inside of the teapot should actually, once you get into the high world of tea, should not be clean because we use boiling water with tea. So it's boiling water and some tea leaves. And as long as you're using the, all of the water out of the teapot and not letting it sit and mold in there, it's actually quite clean. So you just rinse it out with some water, but you don't use a cleanser and a sponge and everything. To, and so some teapots from Asia are really famous for you know, having been around for 40 years in one family. And they say that the flavor that you get from that tea changes significantly over time because of the interaction with the pot. All right, that is fascinating. I had no idea you seasoned your teapot like you might do with stoneware. Or that's really the only, or, or cast iron. That's the only thing I can kind of relate it to. So that's that right. is fascinating. And so we actually did have a couple of questions okay. uh, pop up. So we have one is where in Dallas do you suggest we shop for tea ingredients and other herbs? Oh gosh. I mean, before I started sourcing my own, I went all over the place, but I'm also the kind of person that shops at five different grocery stores because they don't have exactly what I want at this one. Um, so if you're on the high, high, high end of tea, you want the $24 an ounce you know, oolong directly from the organic tea farm that only produces a few hundred pounds of that particular tea a year, I would go to Cultured Cup. They really know their stuff. Um, there are some other lovely tea houses around that sell, you know, by the ounce or by the pound and stuff. Um, they're kind of scattered all over the DFW area. So just look at your regional area, look at Yelp or, or Google it. Um, if you want to buy bulk, um, well, of course we do that. <laughs> but also I would say there are some other interesting startups. If you're looking at um, bulk tea, so Currently, I don't even sell just bulk black tea or bulk oolong. Um, there is a startup that started out of UT Dallas, and I met him, and I'm sorry to say, I can't remember his name, but there was an article written about that tea company in uh, Dallas Morning News because he is sourcing from Africa in war-torn areas and helping women become entrepreneurs at the source side of it and his tea is very tasty and he carries single source so a single oolong or a single green or you know that sort of thing so i would recommend them they have an office down in deep ellum um you know it's a little bit difficult because of course we are in the south we kind of straddle the southeast and the southwest right and um even across North America, 85% of the population that says that they drink tea, which there are a lot of us, um, they drink it iced. So to find an iced tea is really, really different, as you know. Um, you're not looking for those flavor profiles. Um, you're looking for something with a really strong punch because they're going to add a lot of ice to it. It's, it's actually been very difficult for me to curate a combination for iced tea because it's so different from the thinking around hot tea. And I'm, I love any feedback of anyone who wants to taste this, I'll send you a sample. But I think my black, uh, my big DP that I'm gonna show you today has finally achieved that. <laughs> so let me know um, if, you, if it tastes good to you iced. But, um, but what I was gonna say is because we drink it iced, we tend to buy it off the shelf. Um, Lipton is still a favorite. And sometimes we go to maybe a more organic restaurant that has hibiscus tea or something like that. But we're not um, super sophisticated yet on the iced tea side. Uh, so, you know, it's not just Dallas. It's just about anywhere that it's quite difficult to source. Um, and that was one thing that actually happened to me with COVID is that when the supply chain was disrupted, I mean, when 
when Trader Joe's can no longer get brown bags, right? They couldn't get their regular paper bags. Um, how is a tiny company like me going to source some rather unusual herbs and spices? So I have gone to growing my own and working with uh, other small growers in the area, but um, currently none of them are selling. They sell through me because they just aren't producing that much. Um, as a side note, there is a native tea plant that Native Americans used to drink that they introduced to um, the settlers when when we all move this direction. Um, and it is called the Yaupon, Y-A-U-P-O-N tree. And they pick the leaves very similarly. So I don't know if you know this, but the Camellia sinensis tree, you pick only the last two, the youngest two leaves off the sheet. And you have to let the tree grow for at least three to five years. You can't even start picking and children. And then um, they're normally a little bit fuzzy, kind of depends where they're grown. Um, so all those other leaves on that bush for that tree are not being picked. It's just the last two and sometimes the 12. Um, and that determines what kind of tea you have. Uh, the time of the year that it's picked makes a big difference as to what type of tea you're going to process it into. So earlier teas tend to be expensive white and yellow teas, maybe some green teas that don't have a lot of processing, just drying, but have a really mild but incredible flavor. And then the autumn harvest tends to go into the black. So um, to get back to here in the US, when, when I started to run out of my green tea distributor, that they were having trouble sourcing it because the uh, transport component was getting shut off. Um, I started looking for native plants that I could use as a replacement. And there are a couple of uh, organizations, farms, that are now farming the Yapon, which is a holly type, um, the species of holly. And uh, they are in Florida. So, and, and so again, you could Google that if you want to try something very original to this part of the world. All right, that's fantastic information. And I actually uh, was on a different presentation. They mentioned the Yopon Holly tea is gaining in popularity for all the reasons you just said. And I believe there might, might be a company in Austin that is uh, doing that. Uh, but I believe, like you said, they're small and stuff. And I'll see if I can find the information and share it in the chat. And also our Dallas Public Library friends have shared a few uh, links to some books that are available through the Dallas Public Library about tea in general. Um, and so we got another question for you. Uh, can you share a go-to resource for where we can learn more about the medicinal value of different herbs that can be combined into a brew? Ah, now you're getting to my favorite stuff. <laughs> this is where I could go on and on forever. And as you probably know, um, medicinal teas and medicinal herbs are all over the world. They're found everywhere. Uh, I think right now people are particularly focused on turmeric and other things that come from East Asia, but we have plenty of our own right here. So uh, you can just dig into it. A lot of this knowledge is very local and disappearing, unfortunately, it's been disappearing for 30 years. Um, so the best way to find it is to look for older books. Um, what I've found is very old cookbooks, like cookbooks written in the 1800s um, here in the Americas are useful because they quite often notate what the herb was good for, where it was found, that sort of thing. Um, if you're looking at European herbs and spices, the convents uh, kept their own medicinal gardens and have incredible records for that, but don't really share it. Uh, you can tour them if you're in Europe, but they don't really share that knowledge because they still make money from the soap, perfumes, and medicines that they make. 
Um, but they have been doing that since at least the 1600s. In some cases, some of the, the convents have, um, have kept that information since the 1200s. So that's a good resource. Um, lots of Native American lore has this. So you could look at anthropology departments. Um, you can go in person. They're quite willing to talk to people if you're serious. Um, there's some really fascinating uh, herbal knowledge coming out of Africa. And of course, thousands of years of knowledge from Chinese traditional medicine and Ayurveda medicine, which comes out of India, which looks like it's more like 5,000 years. So um, I'll just caution you with one thing. And that's something I've found over the 30 years that I've been making these teas for myself and for friends and family that asked for it. I started this because um, I don't do modern medicine well. So uh, 30 years ago, I had a really negative reaction to a drug that I took to get rid of a sinus infection. And the doctor was kind of stymied and said, well, we don't really know what else to, to give you. And so I looked up a bunch of stuff. I mean, my mother has always thought that food is medicine, right? So I come from that background. Um, so I did some research and uh, I went to Whole Foods and what's that other co-op? But back when Whole Foods still had like big bins of herbs and you just would pull them out into a brown bag. Um, and I put some concoctions together that I had read work and it did work for me. I got right rid of the sinus infection. I'm not prone to it now. And, you know, they say once you get it that you tend to be prone to it. I have not had that problem moving forward. Um, and, uh, but what I want to caution you about is I've also really poisoned myself a few times. So the thing about that I love, but that also makes herbal medicine difficult is that it's very individualized. So we're moving that direction as a modern society, but it's always been around in, um, in the plant world because what we consider plant medicine is actually a defense mechanism most of the time a defense mechanism of that plant against predators like ants or worms or anything that they would encounter in their local environment. And so they utilize that to keep themselves healthy and uh, combat that intruder. And so that tends to be something that works for us as well. And here's another caveat. Um, a lot of the information that's available will tell you what each individual herb and spice does by itself, right? So um, let's use the, the spearmint one. That's a very simple one. It's uh, high in menthol. It's, it does a lot of other things, but we know that it helps clear the nasal and the respiratory system. It tends to be calming. Um, it does a lot of things like that, right? But what I learned when I was um, going through the Amazon and had the great opportunity to meet with those herbal healers, um, this is 25 plus years ago, um, they told me that the, the actual medicinal component occurs through the combination and interaction of the, all the herbs that you're using in that particular tea. And that's why it makes such a big difference how much you use of each particular herb, spice, or tea plant, when that plant was picked. So was it picked during you know winter or summer? That makes a big difference according to what chemical compounds that plant has, what part of the plant you're using. So again, a caution, because uh, I've done this, but um, for example, with a uh, cough, many, many native remedies will say use golden seal or, um, and you know, you just get the ground stuff and you pour it in your cup with a couple of other things and you take it. 
and boy, it packs a punch. And it turns out that the root is like 20 times more effective than the other part of the plant. And so if you throw the same amount, let's say it calls for two tablespoons in your concoction, and you throw two tablespoons of the root, ground root of golden seal in there, then you're you're gonna feel it. And it might always it might not always feel good. <laughs> and so there are a lot of components to this. It's like becoming a chemist, um, almost like a biochemist, right? And th they actually there are some universities around the country that have um, biopharmaceutical degrees now available where you do study those traditional medicines and look at the chemical compounds and what it all does. So, you know, I would encourage that you do that. Um, another thing to keep in mind, though, is that you want to use it for the local setting that you're in. So, again, you know, what works, this big DP, one of the reasons that I named it that is it works really well for North Texas. It might not work as well if you were, you know, visiting my parents in Virginia. <laughs> so it, because the, the location, the seasonality and the weather um, will affect how you feel. Um, and then you're inner microcosm, what you've eaten that day, how much sleep you got, all of that makes a difference too. So it, you know, these native healers were actually taking a huge amount of information and distilling it down into these potions. Um, and I think that's why they were thought of as, you know, kind of where did they get that knowledge? It's always made people very uncomfortable because when people start to look at that, they realize how much knowledge about themselves, about their families, right? Families tend to have similar diseases passed through the generations. All of those things that healer, being local back then without traveling like we do now, um, or we hope to, <laughs> um, but that healer knew all of that. It knew what plants worked well, it knew what diseases you tended to see in the middle of the Amazon, it knew um, the history of your family, maybe back four generations, so what you tended to have issues with, oh, that your, you know, the mother's side of the family generally had this, and your father's side of the family generally had that, so you probably, you know, need a little bit of this and that in your concoction. Um, so it's, it's quite a science, and um, and, and that's why it's fascinating. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn on the kettle, right? Because one of the things I want to talk about is how um, the temperature of the water makes a big difference for different types of teas. So the base of this tea that I concocted today, like I mentioned, is a black tea. Black teas can handle fully boiling water. They, it actually pulls out the flavor more, whereas with a green tea, you don't want the, um, the water to be quite on the boil, as the British say. You want it to be, you know, slightly under when you first pour it on the leaf. Um, since I've added some other herbs to it, let me show you some. I've pulled out some specific, see if you can see that. So that's fennel seed. This is golden mustard seed. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and this is the spearmint. Woo. Um, but one of the things that you can uh, you can see will make a big difference, particularly with herbal teas, is not only the temperature of the water, but the amount of time that you let it steep. So most of my teas that I make because I'm looking for that health effect, um, require a certain amount of time to steep, to pull out all the aspects. And there are two reasons for this. One, I tend to use, as I mentioned, actual seed. So I think you can see it. Um, so you see that the seeds in that, it's not just little grounded mm -hmm. tea. And I don't use powder of anything very, um, 
I do use powdered licorice in some of my concoctions, but most of the time I use the whole plant, whether it's root, seed, flower. Um, and one of the reasons for that is it's only been dried and it's still holding a lot of the essential nutrients that way. The moment you grind them, you release that and it, it um, takes down the efficacy by about 65%. And that's before it goes on the shelf. So I'm trying to deliver the most efficacy, the biggest uh, bang for the buck, right? But for that reason also, you can just use a very tiny amount. So normally I think, um, you know, all of what I work with and tea aficionados normally say that they prefer to work with loose leaf teas, partly so you can see what's going on, but also because there's more, um, there, there's more benefit both for um, fulfilling all your senses, the smell, the taste, everything, all the profiles, but also for the health side, there's more benefit when it's not ground down, or as they call it in the tea world, cut, tear, and curl. Um, <laughs> so uh, the other thing that I like, again, getting back to that circular economy and making sure there's zero waste, is that when you throw it out, first of all, there's no tea bag, so you've eliminated that whole production of bleaching uh, cotton or wood and all of that. You've eliminated that. But secondly, um, if you throw out the grounds of my tea because it has seeds in it, you could actually throw it into some dirt and maybe uh, grow a little mustard plant next spring. Um, so hopefully you continue to have that tea experience. Um, so we're going to put a little, so this cup was made, uh, well, this cup was made recently, but this type of cup was made um, starting in about, I believe it was the 1600s in China. And that's because they started to um, want the tea leaves directly in their cup. So as we talked about, the emperor also drank his tea with the tea leaves directly in the cup and he added hot water. Kind of like I would say a lot of us do here in the States. But then it migrated to using the pot like we saw with Helen. And then it kind of went back. So there are all these um, ways of drinking it as they change the production and processing style of the tea leaves themselves. I don't think you're going to hear my tea kettle boil, so I'm just going to kind of tell you what it sounds like. But anyway, um, so this cup, you can add all of your tea in here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So as I told you, just a little bit for my tea, but you add as much as you want. It's very individual. That's the other thing I like about um, loose leaf tea is some people like very dark tea and other people like it very light. So it's very individualized. You put this into the cup. Um, it does have a top and that's for steeping so that you don't lose all the aromatics because um, when you add herbs and spices, a lot of the goodness is coming through aromatics as well as the actual water. Um, and then the tea in this situation would sound like a re real tea whistle because we're gonna let it go to the complete boil. So the, t the water would be screaming and through an old fashioned tea kettle like this, you know, it's like, um, and then we just pour in the water and cover it up and set it aside. Now, if you're looking for just a tea to drink, I would say in this particular combination, because it has not been ground, that you would need to let it steep for at least two to five minutes. Um, if you're looking for the, the wellness effects, the health effects coming from this, I typically let it steep almost 10 minutes. And there are two reasons for that. One, I have a hard time drinking really hot water. So again, that's personal, you know, preference. But secondly, um, since I don't crush those seeds and leaves, 
um, it allows those to open up and really become part of the team. If you don't do that, you could actually offer the same, but without adding more tea, you could add more water continuously and continue to drink off of it. And that's actually um, the way that we tend to drink it in the West. Um, as you know, from living around here, you could use a lot of tea, particularly black tea, um, with a strainer and make a very deep, dark tea and then add a lot of sugar into it while it's hot to your pleasure. Um, stir it all in, let it all dissolve together and let it cool off to the side. Or you could make sun tea like we do in Texas and then add ice to it and it would make it an ice tea. And what I'm slowly discovering is which uh, herbs and spices do make a good iced tea. And the interesting thing is, in my personal opinion, I don't think that ground spices make a good iced tea. So I'm playing with that because, you know, how do you have chunks of ginger or something like that in, in your iced tea? Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about also that is a, a new trend is what's being called bath tea. So this is kind of what I make. This is like a bath cake, if you can see. And you see all the herbs and spices in there. So that's pre-made for you like a bath bomb. Um, and so you just drop it in, but it's all natural. And it has... Um, the same effects, you know, now that we're learning more about the um, essential and good microbes that live on our body and in our body, we are realizing that hydrotherapy, not hydrotherapy through tea that we drink, but hydrotherapy of a bath or some sort of bathing, which is also a very old way of um, dealing with water and herbs to get better in health uh, is equally equally useful if you're looking for that wellness benefit. And it's very calming. Oh my gosh. If you like to take a bath, try it. There are all sorts of people out there making bath teas, um, very different ways of doing it. So that's kind of a fun little thing to maybe explore and, and also uh, give as a gift um, for people during the holidays because uh, it's very pretty quite often. I, so that's just a bath bomb that I showed you, but um, for the holiday, like I will fill a glass jar with different layers of the herbs and flowers. And then someone could just put a cup of Epsom salt and then add some of those in. Um, that's how a lot of people who are making bath teas do it. So I encourage you to go out there and Google that too, because that's kind of a nice new trend, especially if you like a bath. Uh, let's see, give me a sense of how much time and where you want to go from here. Because as you can tell, I can go on and on. <laughs> Well, actually, I think we're doing okay. So we do, th and thank you for this break. Uh, we do understand that we are getting to the top of the hour and some of our guests might need to return to whatever it was they were doing before, but we will be able to continue the session a little bit longer. Uh, we wanna make sure we get to all your questions. And also, if you have any more, please add those in. And um, Candice, uh, can you please tell us what your website is? So if people want to maybe uh, learn a little bit more or even see what kind of products you have. Sure, thank you. Um, so currently my website is Chandra T, all one word, C H A N D R A T E A dot square dot site S I T E. Um, that's because I was just getting started and I hadn't yet bought the domain. I've now bought the domain but not migrated it over. So it will be Chandra T dot com. All right. And so we actually have had a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you, okay, you say that big D T works. What does it specifically work on? Well, that's a great question. So I, um, when I talked to Helen and everyone else uh, in preparing for this program today, they suggested something for Halloween or the season, you know, uh, now that it's getting colder and wetter. 
So I was thinking about it and um, I couldn't come up with anything scary enough. <laughs> like, you know, spider legs and toad eyes and all that kind of stuff. So I decided to be a little more mundane and just go for the good old, you know, um, if you have a chest cold, this will really work. <laughs> Uh, this is particularly good. So the mustard seed will make you sweat if you're if you are experiencing um, congestion. It'll make you sweat a little bit, but it'll pull it out. Um, the fennel supports that as well, and it also supports your liver as uh, your body is pushing stuff through. Because anything that doesn't get expectorated will work its way through the liver to come out the other side of your body. Um, the spearmint is to open up all those nasal passages and the throat. And the black tea um, actually has some properties too that will open it up. So caffeine constricts your blood vessels. So there's caffeine in black tea. And so that'll pull down the inflammation if you're experiencing inflammation around the chest or the throat. Um, it will also kind of pull together all these other ingredients. Um, and give you a little bit of a kick with the caffeine because I'm sure you're tired if you're experiencing a chest cold. So that's what I think. That's fascinating. Okay. And so you had mentioned earlier, just briefly about, you know, if you can brew your tea with spring water, that that's ideal. So what about using tap water? And I want to add something on there. So I have also heard something about like, you don't want to boil your water too many times. That's is there any, is there any, anything to that? Yes, so um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, any tea aficionado thinks that any leftover tea, uh, leftover water in the tea kettle should be thrown out. I personally let it cool and then put it on my plants because it's basically purified water, so it's good for them too. Um, but yes, everybody believes that you should not reboil it because no water is completely mineral and microbiotic free, right? If it is, it's sterile, which be careful with distilled water because distilled water can be sterile. And that actually leaches nutrients out of the body. So first of all, you don't want to boil off all the, because when you boil a kettle of water, you're through the steam, you're losing any quote unquote impurities in the water. So if you reboil it over and over, it will become like distilled water. And that's not good for you if you drink it. That's my cat. Um, and also because no water is completely, you know, 100% H2O, but has dissolved solids in it, you collect all those solids in the water. Um, and it drastically changes the taste of your tea. So, you know, like if any of you are old enough um, to have experienced tea at a diner <laughs> many years ago where they would make a pot of tea, but then they'd leave it on that burner, like a coffee warmer type thing. And it would just taste terrible because I've never really liked coffee. So I've always been a tea drinker and it just, ugh. and the reason for that is it's condensing all those salts and minerals and everything in the water into your tea and um, bonding with the tannins in the tea and uh, it's just terrible. So that's why. All right. And, oh, and if you can't get spring water, yes, I use tap water all the time. You can use a filter on it. That would be better. Um, but I've looked up the way the city of Dallas processes its water and most of that will boil off in the first boil. So I use tap water. All right. Well, I feel much better about that because I do too. All right. <laughs> and so we had a question about what are your thoughts on decaffeinated tea? Um, so it totally comes from my environmental health background, not as a tea person. Um, I wouldn't touch it because when you decaffeinate, you use a lot of chemicals. And so it's not good for the environment. And if there are any residuals of that um, 
chemical base that they use to the solution that they put the tea leaves in on the tea leaves when you make your tea, it's not good for you either. So personally, I would worry less about the caffeine in tea. It's much, much less than in coffee. And if you buy from a reputable tea um, retailer, then um, it's generally been processed in a way to not pull out the caffeine because uh, tea drinkers don't, most of them do not drink tea for the caffeine. They drink it for other reasons. So that's never been something that either the agricultural producers or the processors have endeavored to bring out into the, into the tea. So it's not something you have to really worry about a whole lot. All right, so I think everybody wants you to taste the tea and tell us what it tastes like. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm taking off the lid. I personally lit the strainer. I'm going to take the strainer out too. Let it kind of drip dry. Oh, if you're really doing tea, then you smell it. And you can put a little bit, when you have a lid, you put a little bit of it on the lid to see how that lid would capture it. And you waft it to like if you're a tea sommelier, this is how you smell your tea. And then you finally get to drink it, just like when you're wine tasting. I must say, I like this blend. <laughs> it's very smooth. I don't know if you can see the color. Uh, so this strainer obviously is, has big holes, so there's still some leaf in there. And you can't really see it, but it's got kind of a, a nice ochre amber color to it. And um, the fennel really evens out the bite of the black tea. So it's very smooth. Um, normally black tea is more earthy, but I think the mustard is taking that out because it doesn't taste super earthy. Because um, I tend towards lighter teas, but I... In this weather, I like a good robust tea. Um, yeah, no. I, please let me know because I'm rather a fan of this one. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. All right, so while you're enjoying that, I wanted to ask you about, what about if you have a bunch of herbs that you grow and about using these to create tea? So I'm going to share with you my, my way that I do it just because that's all I know, right? So I'm hoping you can share maybe uh, a better way to do it. All right. So I went, I just went outside earlier today in the rain and I clipped some herbs that I, I personally grow. So I have some basil. It's really nice. It's got nice big leaves. I have some spearmint. I have some thyme and this is regular thyme. I do have lemon thyme, which, uh, but I just grabbed this one. And then I also have some lemon balm, which looks a lot like the spearmint. And I believe that's what I have here. So I actually have more herbs outside. I also have lavender, I have rosemary, I have oregano, and like I said, I have lemon thyme, but that's what I grabbed today. So what I would do just in my, you know, let's make some tea, right? Uh, I have an electric kettle, a tall one, <laughs> and it has this insert in it, okay? And so uh, it has, it's perforated and everything. So what I would just do, I would literally take all those, I'd rinse them off, of course, I'd wash them. I literally just shove all of those herbs inside of here. And then I put it, uh, you know, I have this filled with water. I put this back in here and then I turn it on and let it boil and it turns off automatically after the boil. And I let it sit for like at least 10 minutes, sometimes 15. And then, you know, it turns this uh, kind of green golden color mm -hmm. and then I would drink it. And I don't add sugar or anything to my tea. I would just drink it like that. So do you have some tips for me to make it even better brew? Well, do you want to add Camellia sinensis to it or not? Remind me what that is again. Oh, that's the, like black or green or oolong tea to it. Uh, you know what? I never, I honestly, you know what? Duh, I never thought about mixing fresh herbs with dry tea. Well, so why don't you give me some tips both ways? Okay, so I have found that lavender goes really well with black tea. 
So if you had some black tea sitting around, you could add your fresh lavender. That would be very tasty. Kind of a winterish drink. Um, I think I would take the basil out because basil kind of overpowers. So either do basil all by itself or leave it out and put it on your food. It um, is a little spicy. I will tell you that when I have put it in my teeth, it is a little spicy. Yeah, it just overpowers. So if you want a more balanced tea, um, since you have lemon balm and lemon mint, that of course goes really well with your mint family. And in this time of year, um, lemon balm is actually a proven antiviral. So to mix it with the tea that open, I mean, with the mint that opens up the congested airways, that's a very, um, you know, especially if you're pulling that straight out of your garden every morning, that's optimal, really optimal, uh, without any, any uh, camellia sinensis, just, just like that. Um, and what did you tell me? You also have thyme? Uh, I have thyme, I have lemon thyme, and uh, oregano, and spearmint. So th the more traditional food spices, um, I would either put on your food, because it will, uh, it, it's interesting, when you put it into the food, it'll bring out different flavors, um, but you'll also taste it more than when just mixing it into the tea that you've had when you're drinking a more concentrated, say, mint and lemon balm tea. Um, if you wanted to add them like I've done today, you know, all together, I typically I find that what I'll call culinary herbs work better in tea when they're dry. So when they're super fresh like that, uh, they taste better on tea. So that's my advice. <laughs> all right. Well, that's why we're all here. We're all here to learn something, right? Yeah. Okay. So if I decided I'd like to dry some of my mint and some of my lemon balm to make tea in the future, uh, do I, I just cut those stems and like I could tie them and hang them upside down and let them dry in the air, right? Yes. That's a good way of doing it. And then crumble them and put them in uh, some sort of paper bag or glass jar. It doesn't need to be well, it kind of depends because it's very humid right now. So maybe airtight, but you got to kind of watch it because sometimes it'll mildew if you put too much. So you want it to be maybe half full. Kind of move it around and not in light. Oh, good point. Yes, keep them in the dark. And yeah. uh, so when I'm drying my herbs and you talked about I could crumble them, that includes the stems and the leaves or should I just be using the leaves? That's up to you. Um, you want to make sure it's truly, truly dry. So uh, when you read how they process the tea plant, the Camellia sinensis, they're very careful to get it under nine, like at least 95% dry. And I would say that's really true of herbs also because they carry a lot of water. Uh, so you just don't want any mildew with it. And that's why I crumble them to make sure, because sometimes they look dry, but they're not yet. Um, Good point. And uh, the stems, I would say it kind of depends on the plant, whether they're going to add anything to it or not. So it's personal preference and what kind of plant you're using. All right. Well, but it looks like e even if I kind of use my, uh, this concoction, I'm not going to be endangering myself in any way. Right. If I just, if I keep on using my kettle and my infuser there, right. None of those will, um, knock it out. Like I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and do be careful of foraging too. Like I would advise anyone and this goes for myself. I'm not yet confident enough to forage. You want to go with someone who's foraged in this specific area for like 18 years. I mean, I wouldn't trust anyone who hasn't foraged for less than 15 years in the specific area for the types of plants you're looking for. It, I mean, you said you're going to have a forager and that's wonderful because you really have to learn it from the true expert. You've got to be super careful with that. You're absolutely right.
Uh, Susana, who we had before for our program, who's doing the program again that uh, Helen mentioned earlier, if you follow her on Instagram, she does share um, different um, different native plants that people can forage that are safe so that she'll share sometimes on her Instagram. Um, her Instagram's Chicana in Nature. If anybody wants to look her up, I'll I'll put it on the Instagram. But she does share some info like that too. Yeah, definitely go to those experts. I mean, I buy from, I don't do that myself. So unless you plan it, be careful. <laughs> That's true. I, I am just using, using stuff that I grow, so I know, but I am excited about uh, the possibility of taking advantage of what we can find. Cause like you mentioned, supply chain disruptions and different things like that. And, you know, we still need to take care of our health and our well Uh And sometimes there are alternative ways to do that. So I absolutely appreciate that. And we have a lot of valuable information in the chat. Uh, and uh, oh, and so I believe, uh, Candace, you have an Instagram page, do you not? I do, yes. It's just Chandra Dees. Uh, I have an S on the end of it for spice. So, because it was too lengthy to write all that out. So Chandra Dees. All right, so everyone, we can uh, have you. Oh, thank you for adding that in there. We have uh, Instagram and we have her website in there, uh, Chandra T dot square dot site. Yes, that's right. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I got that. Right. Okay. And if you guys don't mind, we have a short little uh, uh, survey, satisfaction and feedback survey, if you don't mind filling that out so we can get you even better programming in the, the future. And, uh, and we will leave this up for about a minute. And if you have any other last minute questions, go ahead and add those in the chat because uh, Candace obviously doesn't mind talking about tea uh, while she's here with us. And we want to thank you guys so much. Our program next week on uh, a, a week from this Monday uh, will be about uh, water wise and native plants. So flowering plants that you can add to your landscape that will save water, require less uh, fertilizers and herbicides, which also goes to protect our water. And that was going to be kind of like our kickoff to the WaterWise Landscape Tour that will be on November 7th that everyone is welcome to. To get more information about the WaterWise Landscape Tour, to enter your landscape or to find more about the seminar, please visit savedallaswater.com and also visit the Library Market website to sign up for our next week. And um, oh, another special one is the week after that. Uh, the second Monday in November, we are going to be featuring Veterans Produce, which is a gentleman who is a uh, veteran. He has a hydroponics and aquaponics greenhouse that he will be touring us through. So I know a lot of people are interested in hydro and aquaponics. So that will be in two Mondays from now. Next Monday will be uh, beautiful and beneficial water-wise plants. So on behalf of uh, Chandra Tees and the Dallas Public Library and Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Thank you so much for joining our program and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Pat.